We're continuing our partnership with the Ayn Rand Institute, and this week I'm sitting down with two of their top intellectuals, Ankar Gatte and Greg Salmieri. Welcome to the Rubin Report. Thanks, great to be here. I am glad to have you guys in studio because we've all done things publicly together. Some of the things have been uh, aired on this channel. We're doing a series with you guys on happiness. How happy are you guys, I guess would be the first question, but before we get to that, <laughs> Uh, before we get to that, uh, let's just tell people a little bit about yourselves in case they aren't familiar with you. And then, so we're going to be airing one of these on the Rubin Report channel, and then the other five are going to be on the ARI channel. So, Ankar, why don't you take it away? So, I'm, uh, I work at the Ayn Rand Institute. I've been there a while now. I think I joined September 2000. I'm a philosopher. I got interested in Ayn Rand and philosophy in high school. It's an interesting story we could talk about because it relates to the whole issue of what impressed me about her and, and her, her interest in happiness and her interest in morality. Um, and I, I mean, I lecture around the country. I teach at the Institute. Um, that's my story in a nutshell. <laughs> Quick and precise. Let's yeah. see if you can beat that. Wow. I don't know if I can. Uh, so I'm, I'm Greg Salmieri. I um, guess I'm a consultant at the Institute or I, I do various things for them, speak at different things, but I'm not you know, a regular employee there. Uh, I teach part-time at Rutgers. I do a lot of uh, writing and research on a number of topics, Aristotle, Ayn Rand, uh, issues in theory of knowledge and morality. Yeah, it's a lot of pressure in a weird way to talk about happiness, isn't it? Because it's sort of, it's very self-reflective mm -hmm. to say, all right, we're gonna talk about happiness. Well, it's a weird question, but I'll start it that way. How happy are you? How important is happiness to you in your day-to-day -day life? It's super important. Um, and I think one has to reflect a lot on one's life to think, like, am I happy or not? And to ask it very honestly. Um, I think I am now. I like all the core elements of my life, but there were certainly periods in my life where I would answer no to the question. Yeah. Um, and that's, the, to go back to high school, like I was not happy in high school. Um, I was a good student. The school, I was at a public school in Canada school wasn't very good. I was bored all the time. Um, and I never, I couldn't find people that I was interested in. And it, it wasn't a very happy period. And it, I got to the thinking about it. And I realized like, part of why I'm always, I didn't have, like I wasn't bullied at school. I didn't have a lot, a lot of conflicts, but I disagreed with everybody about everything. <laughs> and it, it was like, it was a constant. Well, you're in the right line yeah. of work now. <laughs> yeah. And I disagree with teachers and how they were teaching in the classroom. And I was um, I'm probably a little obnoxious about it, about like, you don't know how to teach and this is not very interesting. And at some point I realized that it's, I have a very different view about what's good and evil than my teachers do. So why is that and what exactly is good and evil? And that's what started me on my path into philosophy. Yeah. I thought, I'm not going to learn anything in high school about <laughs> this. So I went out in the library and got books and started reading that kind of thing. And um, it was my older brother had read Atlas Shrugged. And when he saw this is what I'm doing sort of on my spare time, he said, you've got to read this book. And what impressed me so much about the book was the seriousness with which she took like you can think of it as the American conception of the pursuit of happiness, mm -hmm. how seriously she took that, and that the two main characters that you're with sort of from beginning to end in the story are actually not happy at the beginning of the story, and it takes a lot for them to mm -hmm. realize that there's things in their lives that are not going as well as they could and should, and they're not really sure why, but unless they really think about it and explore the different issues, they'll never figure it out, and that like that's what really impressed me about the book and I just started reading all of Ayn Rand. Yeah, and I love that because it so gets to personal responsibility and what your adventure in life should be to attain happiness if, if that's what you want to attain. So obviously I want to define happiness, but first I want to ask you that question. Am I happy? Uh, are you happy? Yeah, I am now. I've been thinking about this um, a lot recently because of uh, some personal issues that I'm, I'm trying to deal with. and I'm, you know, there's always things in your life that you want to improve, or, and that's part of what living a good life is, that you're always trying to improve. But when I put them in perspective, and my wife and I were talking about this just the other night, we're both really happy when we think about where we wanted our lives to be when we were younger, and where we are now, and the state of our relationship, and we both love our work, and we both see room for, you know, continued growth in all of those things. Uh, I really am. 
is one of the tough things about talking about happiness that you, there's this idea that if you're happy, somehow you should be happy all the time, that you'd be on this continuum of happiness, you would never frown, you'd never be upset, something like that, versus somebody that I think would be a little more of a realistic portrayal of reality, which, who is happy, hopefully attaining happiness over, over time, but also struggles with things, is on the adventure of life, is gonna be depressed, all of those things. Does that make it hard to talk about happiness? Yeah, our vocabulary, uh, by our I mean, you know, the world, yeah. uh, it leaves something to be desired here. Um, the happiness and joy and pleasure are sometimes used too synonymously. You know, I was happy for 15 minutes and then I was unhappy. Um, in that sense of happiness, like a transient feeling, like enjoying yourself, um, yeah, you can't be that all the time. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, there's probably you, some and drugs you, And you that. shouldn't, yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, there might be the drugs, but they'll make you less happy long term yeah. in other ways if you do too much of them. So, um, but I think of happiness as a, a characteristic of a life, and it's not detached from your feelings. It's, in effect, the, well, I'll just use Rand's definition for a quick way, and she describes it as the, the state of consciousness that proceeds from the achievement of your values. And I take it that's not a state that you're in every moment mm -hmm. uh, of feeling a certain way every moment, but it's a, a, a feeling you could have about how your life is going in general that I think is there even when there's a particular setback or thing that you're uh, sad or depressed or anxious about. Uh, there's a kind of undercurrent of, yeah, but I'm happy with my life and you know this thing sucks, mm -hmm. but, uh, but life as a whole is going well. And right, so would you say that happiness is sort of a, it's a long game? Yeah, I think it's a long game and it's an enduring state. So it's, you can talk about, I mean, when I think of, of myself and I, when I'm asking the question, am I happy or not? It's sort of a whole perspective on your life and your experience of it that colors all the day-to-day -day activity. So I think it's impossible for someone to be happy and not suffer setbacks, frustrations, periods of real um, um, disappointment because part of the, it is, you have to have a real ambition for goals and to keep building and to keep achieving more. Part of the, the issue of the personal responsibility is th to have a real growth mindset. And if you have a growth mindset and you're trying new things, you're gonna fail, you're gonna fail regularly. Yeah. But you have a perspective on yourself that that's not the end story on me. That's just part of the process of achieving difficult values. And if you really have a perspective on yourself that yeah, I'm capable of achieving difficult values, and I'm worthy of it. Like it's, I deserve to reach. In 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 the thinking again, long term, I deserve to reach that. You have an underlying state that colors everything, and I think that's when we're, when you're looking either at yourself or other people and asking like, are they happy or not? You're not asking, are they laughing here at dinner tonight or so on? You're asking a much more fundamental issue about their perspective and experience of their own life. Yeah, so I'm glad that you mentioned earlier the, the pursuit of happiness, because it's a great phrase that our founders came up with. I think it was Thomas Jefferson. Um, nobody else has that. Nobody else in a founding document that I know of has the pursuit of happiness. What, what do you think they, meant when they said the pursuit of it, not to be happy. It didn't say, and to be happy, it said the pursuit of it. That's pretty good. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, it's important that there, it's the, the, the right to the pursuit of happiness that's being defended, because uh, your goal in life isn't just to pursue, but to get it. Um, although it's uh, one of these things that you're achieving, it is a constant pursuit. You're constantly pushing forward. But I think the significance of pursuit in the Declaration is, that uh, the Declaration is saying what government is there for. And government is there to protect our rights. And what are these fundamental rights that we need a government to protect? And one of them is the pursuit of happiness. And that's understanding that what's worth having out of life is something each of us must create for ourselves. We can't expect to be given it by other people, given it by the government. We can't expect a society to be organized so as to make us happy. Uh, but we do need a society that's organized so as to protect our ability to pursue and achieve our happiness for ourselves. And that's what I see the insight in the Declaration as being. So what makes a life worth living then? If it's not just immediate pleasure, a series of pleasure, 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 pleasure till you're, till you're gone, how do you get from, okay, I want to be happy to the long game of, oh, I've lived a happy life? I think one of the one of the ways Rand puts it in a formulation that I like, she calls it the successful state of life, 
And I think of thinking of it like that successful state of life. If you think of all other living things, they're, they can be in a state where you say they're really thriving. Or they can be in a state where they're sort of eking by, but they're not firing on all cylinders. And in terms of thinking about happiness, it's of thinking of a life, what are all the requirements of it to be successful? And not to look for things outside of life, to give it justification or more, that I'm pleasing a God or I'm pleasing a society, but it's I'm living up to my own standards that I've defined. And if I do that over a lifespan, I'm going to look at my life and think of it as successful because I'm really doing everything that a life requires. I think that's the perspective uh, that is, it's, it's very different because when people talk about finding meaning in life, they're always looking for something outside. Mm -hmm. And I think the perspective one should have is you have to build meaning into your own life by having a perspective on what is a human life, what is a successful human life? And think about that of yourself and think about that of other people. I actually think in what you were asking about the pursuit of happiness, that's part of the whole enlightenment conception mm -hmm. of happiness. Uh, one of the things I like about Jefferson, if you've been to Mont, have you been to Monticello? I've been there many yeah. times, yeah. The, yeah, it's a great place. It's, it's and incredible. The, the gallery of worthies that he mm -hmm. has, it's a bunch of people who he respected and that you think of as, I think, in moral terms, it's people you want to emulate. There was, and not maybe everything about them, but there was something really significant. So some of the people he has up of Newton and Locke, there's something really significant about Newton's incredible passion for knowledge and discovering new things and the more I can build that into my soul that's a good thing because that's part of what it means to live a successful life mm -hmm. so of, of thinking of it like that of what you're building into your life rather than something outside is gonna say oh you're good or you've or you, you have a warrant for being so it's, it's a very different uh, conception I think of how to think about it so I suspect you agree that this this worthiness comes from within yeah, and there's, there's your sense of yourself as worthy, but there's also the sense of life as being worth living, that you love your life. And I think, you know, part of it is to be someone who's firing on all cylinders and fully living a life, you need to think of yourself as good and you need to be able to, you need to have self-esteem and that's something I think we'll talk about more uh, in some of the later sessions. But also you need to really love what you're doing. You need to love the life you're living and you need to have a sense of what a life is that's worth living. And I, one of the things that really made things click into place for me in thinking about life is, is the idea that, you know, life is, is a process. It's, and Aristotle says it's an activity, and I think there's something really profoundly right about that. It's not a state you have, but it's something you do. Mm -hmm. And then what I think um, Rand adds to that, or at least what she added to that for me, is that it's an activity of creating more of itself. It's a self-sustaining activity. And you should be able to look at your life, or I think in the best life you could look at them and you could say, these are the different parts of my life, and here's how they all contribute to one another. Here's how they uh, help keep me alive, literally. Here's how they help keep me motivated. Here's how this thing fits with that. And you could see the pieces as integrated and organized into a whole in the way that you can look at a plant and see how the different organs of the plant, the leaves and the whatever, are organized into a whole where each has its role to play. And likewise in a life, like this is my relationship, this is my job, these are my hobbies. I love them all and I love how they fit together. And uh, I think that, you know, reaching that kind of perspective on your life is, um, I know the more I've reached that, the more I've enjoyed living and the more I've felt happy. Yeah, do you think there are times in life where putting the premium on happiness is not the most important thing? That there might be times where you really have to say, work really hard at a job you really hate. Now I get it, in the long game, you're doing it for a goal. You're going, I gotta do all this horrible stuff so that I can get out and have enough money to maybe own my own business or something yeah. like that. But that there's a, a certain uh, ebb and flow to when, say, happiness is more or less important. I, mean, I don't think of it as about happiness in that way. I, I mean a little bit of a silly thing to bring up, but when I um, moved to graduate school, I moved to Pittsburgh to go to graduate school, I didn't, hardly knew anyone there, I was lonely, I was spending all my time working, which I liked, but I was uh, away from all my friends and I didn't quite like or fit into the group I was in, and I wasn't in a day-to-day -day way happy. 
And uh, I was writing songs at that time. And I wrote this song that had this line, there were times in a life when you just have to think about walking one foot in front of the other one and footsteps and fragments that don't form a whole. And I was writing this song very much about how sometimes you've got to do this. You've got to go through this period where you're just minding your next step and you don't know what it's leading to. Uh, and I think that's true. And I've thought back on that with other friends who I've seen in situations like this and we've been talking about it. But I didn't think of it as, now I'm not focusing on, on happiness. I was thinking, what I really want out of life, what I want my life to be, what will make me happy long term is something that requires going through this period that's stressful and unpleasant. And when you look at it in that light, you know, you don't love and, and, and enjoy with great vigor the things that you otherwise didn't enjoy, but you start to see what's enjoyable about them. You start to have a more positive spin on them. And I did overall really enjoy my time in graduate school, for example. Um, even though there were times when I was lonely before I made friends there and stuff. Right, so, so I guess that's really what I mean, that there's, like, let's say there are tough jobs that people have to have, or jobs that aren't patently enjoyable. Let's say you're a ditch digger. Now, I'm sure you can pil pilfer some joy out of it, and maybe, mm -hmm. maybe seeing people on a day-to-day -day basis deal with the most fundamental, you know, life and death stuff maybe gives you some sort of profound view on life, but like the action of doing what you're doing probably isn't bringing you that much happiness. This is where you would say the long game kicks in and you just have to kind of suck. But you know what, there are probably people that are 70 that are ditch diggers that aren't happy that have been doing it forever. Yeah, so it's, it's tough. I think there's also some who have been doing it for a long time and are happy. Mm -hmm. I, I think any work... I don't want to put down ditch diggers, yeah, by yeah, the way. Yeah, I, was yeah, just, yeah, I was just yeah, trying to... I mean, those yeah. fighting words. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think anyone who's doing something productive, and I think ditch digging is, and if they're really at their capacity, um, they can find real enjoyment. And I've, I, I mean, I've met people, I mean, garbage collectors and things like that, who I think they really like their job. Yeah. And it's, they're sort of at their capacity. I think it's more when you're in a job that you know you could be doing way more than mm -hmm. you're doing, and it just feels like routine and rote, then it's, you're, you're, you have this feeling that it's, I'm can do more than this, there has to be more than this in life. And if you have that, I think, the, yeah, you have a period where you're not satisfied in your work. But it's, it is, you can do all kinds of things to try to get and improve on your situation. And the more you're doing that, the more you'll feel this sort of responsibility for your own life, and the more interesting it will be. Like, this is a challenge that I need to overcome. I'm in a career that I feel like it's a dead end, and I could be doing more than this. How do I figure out another thing to be doing. And that in itself is interesting and challenging. And so it, it's, there's a process to gaining values and things that you want. And I don't think happiness is just about the end point. It's about that whole process mm -hmm. and having a perspective on that this is what living is about. And it is often about, like there's challenging circumstances. I have to figure out what to do. But the I, figuring out is interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, you're remember. facing this with with leaving Patreon, and it's it's got to be in one sense like frightening and really annoying. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's another opportunity to do, and it and it. Well, I'm very much. Uh, I wasn't even planning on bringing that up, but I'm very much feeling that right now. Uh -huh. That you know, I've had a good run these last couple of years, and I'm I'm so proud of what I'm doing, and I I have the values that you guys are talking about. I wake up every day, and I'm not like looking around like, well, what do I got to do today? Like, there's just so right. much happening, and I think I'm doing something important, and you know, I have a good life. Um, but then you know, things happen, and suddenly you go, whoa, seventy percent of my rev is going to disappear. I got to figure it out. But it's been actually inspiring. I'm actually more inspired now, and I guess that means I have played the, the long game, right? What I was gonna yeah. mention, though, was that I remember years ago uh, when I was a struggling stand-up comic and I used to have to hand out tickets on the street in Times Square to, just to get stage time. We didn't even get paid mm -hmm. to do it, and I was miserable. I mean, I was absolutely miserable, because you had to do it, where, you know, it, it could be you know, five degrees outside and freezing cold, and I was wearing two pairs of underwear and two, you know, two pairs of socks and all that. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was miserable, really miserable, and there was a homeless guy named Charlie who used to sit outside our comedy club and ask for money. He had a funny little sign about, you know, I just need this money for weed or beer or something. And, and he always had the biggest smile on his mm -hmm. face. And I thought, this homeless guy is happier than me. This is a problem. And I remember thinking, this is one of the, I've got to turn some things around. So sometimes seeing someone uh, that you wouldn't expect to be happy could be a good instigator of your own happiness. 
Yeah, or just thinking about it. I don't know, you know, don't know Charlie. So, um, I hope he's still around. He, yeah. I do know some of those guys in Times Square, though, and I've, I <laughs> haven't realized they were comics. Well, I now, I, ironically, so now. now they're not usually, okay. because now the clubs just hire people, you know, for a little bit here and there. Uh, but back then it was. So yeah, reflecting in the old days. on different people, and particularly if you find, this isn't the case in your example, but sometimes people find themselves resenting people or envying people. And if you find that you're doing that, and then you think, you know, that's a wake up call to think like, what don't I have? That why, why can't I be happy for this person whose life is going well? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, there are times when you need to rethink what you're doing for that reason. I, there is one thing I wanted to add to what we were saying before about um, times when you can't be happy and the person who's a ditch digger, which is, so there are, in the history of philosophy, and particularly Greek philosophy, which is where, where I uh, do a lot of my work, there's a, there's, always, there's a movement and there's a strand in Greek philosophy and in Stoicism and Epicureanism, and you can see it coming back now in some of the Neo-Stoics, and Sam Harris, I think, is sort of is in a way in this mold in some of what he says, where you want to try to, um, the way the Stoics would put it, is not give hostages to fortune. Mm -hmm. You want a kind of conception or a view of happiness where it's just a matter of what you do in your own head, and you can be happy anywhere. If you're in North Korea, if you're in the Gulag, if you're, you know, we're forced to be in Times Square giving out those tickets rather yeah, than... Yeah. Um, it's an inside job. Yeah, it's an inside job, exactly. And you, uh, and if you have, if, if happiness were like that, and you have a view of it like that, then um, you would want to be able to say someone who always aspired to do something, he started ditch digging in the meantime, it was always a stopgap for him, but he never got past it. Well, he can still be happy, because it's just what's inside. Uh, and I don't think that's right. I mean, I think Aristotle thought, I certainly think, I, I ran things, that you know, happiness is, you have to have goals. They're goals that are um, achievable, um, but not guaranteed success, even if you do your best. And there are situations where I think someone's really doing their best. They're really trying as much as they can to grow, but there's real tragedy, something horrible happened, and then they're not happy. Mm -hmm. But I would still say about those people, um, it's worth it. They're, they're, uh, doing, they have a, as good a mental life and as good a life as can be had in those kind of circumstances. Yeah. And I don't think they'd be happier if they kind of gave up. So if we're thinking of the, and, and contented themselves with some inner serenity. So if we're thinking about someone who's, you know, ditch digging at 70, started at 20, we want to think about, you know, why, what were his goals. You can come up with a version of him that's really happy. Right, there might, right. Yeah. the 70 year old that's done it for 50 years might be happy if he, mm -hmm. if it was within the scope of what he wanted out of his life. and and he has a family, let's say, and whatever else, then... And he's thinking about how to do it better and what this yeah. means to him, and he takes pleasure in mentoring the younger guys about what's the more efficient way to do it. Uh, but you could also picture a version of him where he's a kind of embittered Hulk and, uh, you know, for bad or good reasons. So this harkens to where we started here, but so when we're talking about happiness, and I think people then think you're walking around with this big smile on your face all day and you're, you're, you're like you're on ecstasy or something, so let's say someone close to you dies, someone in your family dies. Well, now you can't be happy per se, but, but I think what you're both saying is that, the, that if you have collected the right ideas around yourself, that although you don't have to be happy in that moment, that the way you will react to tragedy would be in the long term, still, would still allow you to be on a track of happiness. Is that, is that fair to say? I think it, it can allow you to be on the track, but there can be circumstances where if you lose a spouse, that it can be so devastating that, per, and particularly I think if it's later in life, um, to sort of unwind your life from that and want to build another life where you, your time horizon is not that long, I, I think there are people who it's just, they can't get over it. Mm -hmm. and, it and I don't blame them, I don't think it's, it's but there are other cases where I think, um, yes, it, it's a tragedy. You're clearly unhappy for a period of time, but you need to rebuild. And it's, again, rebuilding a life and not thinking there was this only one life that was set out mm -hmm. by some divine plan, and now it's fallen through, and that's it for me. It's to rebuild. But the rebuilding is really difficult, I think, in what, if you imagine like real tragedy. Yeah. Um, um, and it, 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 it's, I think it's possible, but you would have to know a lot about the details to think, is it, do I think this person is not really trying? And so not 
being able to reorient, or he's trying, but it's really, really difficult. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned time and uh -huh. age there, because that definitely is a big piece of this, right? I mean, if you if you lose a spouse close to the end of your life, and then suddenly have to reevaluate your life and think, wow, I, I missed all of these opportunities, you're probably going to end your life pretty bitter, as opposed to, oh, we did everything we could, and now it's just another adventure for, yeah. for me, a solo adventure that maybe I didn't want or expect. I mean, you have to think about your plans for a life in the, and, and what you want out of life in the context of reality, and part of reality is mortality. So, um, you know, I'm married, I love my wife, we're looking forward to getting old together. I mean, that, you know, we want to be young, young together yeah. every long time. <laughs> but we have things that we're planning on doing. But, you know, we both know one of us is going to, we're both going to die, and the odds are, unless there's some accident or something, one of us will die first. And so if your, your view of what you want your life to be like is, you know, like, well, we'll, you know, at 95 be in our beds together with our hands held and we'll just both right uh, die that's not possible and so right. we can't well it happened of... in the guy in uh ryan gosling in uh the notebook but besides <laughs> right. that okay. outside of the notebook <laughs> yeah it, anyway it's not yeah. something you could realistically aim for yeah so if um if i imagine a situation where one of where we're older and you know one of us uh dies first and then um i think well is there time to start another relationship do i want that if not I'll expect that there'll be a feeling of loss, you know, something missing for the rest of the time, but that'll be part of uh, the broader context of I wanted a relationship, I didn't want, I wanted her, I didn't want a situation where I was invulnerable to anything to happen to me because I didn't care about anything. And I understand that that will lead to some suffering and sorrow at the end, and I'll think of my life as having been happy, and a happy life on whole, even if this year or that year isn't happy, and I expect that there'll be enough things in the time left to me that whether I have another relationship or not, or I spend more time with my friends or on certain hobbies, um, you know, that kind of thinking, both at that time and now looking forward to it, I think is part of um, planning for a life and, and thinking of what's to be happy. What I think of as really tragic is, you know, someone breaks in and murders her suddenly in front of, and I have trauma, or mm -hmm. you lose a child in a horrible way. Th those are the kinds of things that I think um, aren't just, it's a kind of loss that you have to factor into your thinking about life that you'll suffer at some time, but a kind of just a real horror. And those, I think, are much harder to recover from. You usually only need therapy. And Right. How much of the happiness conversation do you guys think is just about being present? Just sort of present and aware in what's going on with you? Because I know at the moments when I find myself the happiness, it's almost like at the end of a day where I was like, whoa, I just did everything. I'm having a lot of these lately where my days are so full with often difficult conversations. I'm not even talking about what I'm doing in here, like, you know, just business things and a thousand other things where I'm like, it's, you know, it's like midnight and I'm like, wow, I am beat because I just had a day, you know, and it's like I didn't think about it during the day because I was present. I was just doing my thing. Mm -hmm. But how important is that, that which is sort of time related in an immediate sense? So you're thinking about, is the question sort of when are you happy in the moments when you're present or later looking back on that? Well, how important is just being present, just okay. being present in, in the moment in your day-to-day -day life? I, if, yeah, if I, th if I get what you're getting at, I have that kind of experience too. So it's, it's um, there's often this kind of idea that to be happy, you don't aim directly at happiness. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's true as formulated. But it's true that you're not every moment of your day thinking, am I happy, and sort of it's this kind of self-reflection. And I think if you really love what you're doing, you often get lost so, in the Right, that, that's yeah. what I'm talking about. That and, you would get lost in your yes. day enough to not even, it wouldn't be something that you're aiming at because it's, it is, it just is. Yeah, and I actually think it's a good way to pick a career of what are the things that you actually do and you sort of lose track of time and you feel I could be doing this indefinitely and okay, it's midnight, so I gotta go to bed. Mm -hmm. That's how I picked philosophy because I was in, in high school, I was in math and science, that's what I was interested in. I hated all my humanities courses. I was convinced that that's my career path. But then I started to ask myself, like, what do I do when I'm not in school? <laughs> And, and what do yeah. I like to do? And, what, and it was all, it's philosophy. That's what I thought about, that's what I read. And so, so I thought, 
I need to make this a career somehow because that's what I really love to do. And it's the do, it's the end result you're interested in, but it's the doing towards the end result. It's that whole thing that's really important. So I think it's a very important experience in life to be lost in creating things and to then and, and then to step back and think, like this is really important about my life, that this is what I like to do and like to build. So that, that's a good segue to morality and happiness. And you reference Sam Harris, who's obviously been on the show mm -hmm. many times and, and talks about morality. Um, what is the relationship between morality and happiness? So I think of it as happiness is this sort of emotional state or perspective, state of consciousness that comes from a certain kind of life. It's the, the internal sense that you're living, and true sense, you know, that you're living a certain life, the way it feels to live a successful, as Anka put it, uh, human life. And morality, as I think of it, is um, the principles that tell you how to lead such a life, that define what kind of a life is worth living and possible to live for a human being. I mentioned before the idea that in a, a, a life, like a plant's life or an animal's life or a human life that's functioning well, the parts are kind of working together to make the life, each one is helping the other, so it's a self-sustaining whole. And there's just like there's a type of life for uh, this plant or that animal, the kind of, you know, for every species has its way that it does it. Uh, I think there's a way that a, the human species does it when it does it, uh, but we don't do it automatically. And morality is the, um, defines what the principles are for doing that, what the shape or structure of a human life is. So how would you then define morality? I get what it's mm -hmm. defining, and right. I, I've heard you talk about this. You actually had a really, we did an event uh, just about six months ago with Jordan Peterson and Yaron Brook, mm -hmm. and, and you and Jordan really got into this. So let's, we don't have to go that yeah. far on it, but how would you then define morality? So I'd say the standard of value that you're selecting things on, and this I'm taking from my rant, is man's life or human life, like what works for human life, and then what are those things? Well, the central values, our reason, it's our mind by which we live, by which we figure out what values to pursue and how to pursue them. So really cherishing your mind and thinking about what you can do to preserve it, to make it work better, to um, not undermine it. Um, so I think that's the one, the primary major value. You think about long range, what's good for your mind? So like not filling yourself with falsehoods, for example, not allying to yourself and others, like facing the facts, right? Um, so one, valuing your mind, Two, being purposeful, thinking that, um, recognizing that your life is something you have to create for yourself. So thinking about what values you want out of life, how they're gonna fit together into a self-sustaining whole like this, and then holding yourself to pursuing them. And then recognizing that you have to earn your own, uh, your own appreciation for yourself, earn your own motivation, and that's valuing self-esteem. So I think those three values are really central. And then there are a bunch of virtues by which you pursue them, and the main one is rationality, which is you know facing the facts, looking and valuing and cherishing, knowing what's true. Always, um, whenever there's a question of like, is this, do you place what's true above something else? Learning what's true above maybe a fear about what might be true or a wish for what might be true, always prioritizing, you know, knowing what's true, reality mm -hmm. first. So we're gonna do many more of the shows are gonna be touching on morality and happiness, but I, I, which we're gonna be hosting on the ARI channel, uh, but I wanna get your take on that as well. Yeah, I think one of the things to get that's very unusual in Rand's view um, that, that I agree with completely, particularly in the modern world, we tend to think of this morality and practicality, and you have to choose between them. So, and the more moral you are, it's you're gonna give up your money, your time, you're gonna become a martyr or a saint. And, so, and it's not practical, but it's what morality demands. Or else you're gonna live a more practical life and then you disregard morality. You're not interested in it because it gets in the way. And her view is that this is not a real mm. or proper choice in life. You're trying to bring these together that morality helps you think about what is practical and achieve it, but it helps define what you're trying to achieve. And the whole issue of looking both at yourself and other people and thinking, what do I want to emulate? I think is a really important aspect of morality. And it's again, to build a life. So it's, I'm not gonna be bifurcated. It, I'm pursue money, but that's not moral. And so then that half the time I'm gonna give it away or in the second half of my life, like I think a lot of people like Bill Gates and so, it, there's, a, there's an aspect of I've been too practical 
not enough morals in the second half of my right, life. Right, right, right. And, and yeah. it, there's a real, like, I admire Bill Gates much more than the creator of Microsoft. Um, and I think one should think of that as a moral dimension. This, is, it was, this was a massive achievement. Um, and morality is about teaching to achieve that kind of successful life. And this is why I, I brought up the gallery of worthies. I think this is the older perspective on morality, or at least you're getting this in the Enlightenment. So you can think of, you put up a portrait of Isaac Newton. You can think, I'm never going to be Isaac Newton. I mean, this is a great, <laughs> maybe the greatest genius in history. Right. I'm not, if, and if one's thinking of emulation like that, I'll never be that. But I can have that dedication to knowledge and truth in my own life, in my own way, and try to build that into my soul. And he, I mean, Jefferson had a lot of different kinds of people in his thing. And that's what I think morality is about. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it's completely intertwined with, this is what I'm going to practice. Mm -hmm. I'm going to build these things into my soul, and this is the kind of person I'm going to be. And that's, I think, Ayn Rand's conception of morality. It's very different than what is around. Yeah, so wait, so let's sit with the Bill Gates one for a second, because I think that's sort of interesting. So, I mean, I think your argument basically is, this guy did a lot of good stuff for, for, for many years. He built all sorts of businesses and, and operating systems and all of these things. Yeah. But then in the second part of life, it's almost like you have to say, well, that wasn't the stuff that really mattered. It's that I'm gonna do all this new, like somehow truly good stuff or truly yes. moral stuff. And if you think of what happened to him, it was, he was criticized for what I regard as his virtues. He was criticized because he built Microsoft into the most profitable um, and uh, company, and I mean, he's the, the leader in the tech industry. Um, and he, he had a vision of what he wanted, a computer on every desk, and I'm going to achieve that. And he got all kinds of negative press about Microsoft's operating system. Is no, you can make all kinds of criticisms of every kind of product. Right. You go build something half as good as this, that connects the <laughs> right. world then, together. Then we'll talk. And well, I see this about Elon Musk all the time yes. now. It's like the press against him is insane. It's like this guy, he literally sent a car to orbit just because he could. I mean, he's building underground tunnels in LA for traffic purposes. Yeah. He's doing incredible, the Tesla, I mean, he's doing incredible things and yet the media loves attacking him and it's a very bizarre, and dichotomy. I mean, yeah, and with Bill Gates, Tesla, I think I think of as a little bit more mixed case because there's so much government involvement and stuff. Ah, that's for a but, whole. That's yeah, for a whole but other Bill show. Gates, yeah, there was none of that, uh -huh. and there was no lobbying, or they didn't even have an office in Washington. So until the, so it wasn't just the press. Until the Justice Department went after them, that what so what I mean, the meaning is what you're doing is unjust because you're giving a browser away for free. It was really, really bad. And if you have a person who's, who's serious about their life and starts thinking, yeah, so is what I'm doing moral? Or are there some of these accusations, is there some teeth to them? And I think, unfortunately, what happened is, yeah, no, there is some teeth to them. And I've been lucky. There's this whole egalitarian mm -hmm. view that denies free will completely. And if Bill Gates was lucky, he was set up at Harvard, had the right parents. Any which, idiot yeah, could yeah, have yeah, done yeah, it. Yeah, which yeah. is, I mean, a joke. But he's absorbed some of that. And I think there's an element of his career now as, a, as, as um, involved in charity and so on, is an element of guilt. I think there's an element, when you look at how he does it, that it's still, he's pursuing the things he's interested in. There's, it's very science and education oriented. He's still, I mean, the, he was described as reading on his vacation. So PhD theses of, of, that have just come out to find new ideas. And it sounds like he still does that in this world mm -hmm. that he's in now. So I think it's a mixed case. There's an element of guilt that he should not feel guilty for, but the whole culture had pushed that you should feel guilty for this tremendous achievement. Is that, a, is that a very bizarre thing to be happening in a capitalistic society that somehow you could do something, create something that everyone wants and then still at the end feel, oh no, if I only just did more. We see this now a lot, you know, just in the last couple of weeks with uh, Alexandria Cortez and this 70% uh, tax rate, which if you live in New York City, uh, would be after New York State and city taxes would be 84%. I get it doesn't kick in till after 10 million, but just this idea that somehow because someone has that they should morally, and she said moral here, that's what she said, the morality of it would be to give up. And that, that's actually 
in my estimation, that would be the reverse of what would lead to happiness, either from the person that it's being taken from or the person that it's being given to. Yeah, I agree with you there, but I don't agree that it's bizarre. I mean, it's bizarre by the standards that I think there should be, but it's not bizarre by the standards of how our society has been, how capitalism has been practiced. It's never been practiced consistently. There's always been either a hatred or a love-hate relationship with the great achievers under capitalism. Mm -hmm. You can see this even in the 19th century, the robber barons and all the kind of um, opprobrium that was heaped on uh, Rockefeller and Carnegie and Vanderbilt and so forth, uh, J.P. Morgan. Um, and we still have it. So I think the, the moral views, the views of what's good that are baked in to our society from at least the time of Jesus uh, are views that are uh, anti-success on life, anti-happiness, think not for the morrow, consider the lilies in the field, don't be too selfish, pride goeth before a fall, or cometh before a fall, pride's before a fall. <laughs> and um, if you take the, those kinds of views seriously, and we're all taught to, Right, we're all brought up with that in one way or other. It's in the culture. Then I think um, Cortez is right. I mean, that's where that's where mm -hmm. those moral views end up, and it's not a surprise that we always have people like this, and they go through flurries of being popular. And it's not just her. I mean, uh, you know, Tucker Carlson's going on now, sometimes saying about people who have faith in free markets and they don't want enough regulation. Mm -hmm. It's the people who are thought of as the left and people who are thought of as the right, all except. And you know we're all brought up to accept this altruism, this uh, anti this worldly, anti success, anti individualistic mindset, and it comes up in different people's mouths in different ways, uh, putting down the successful people, demanding that they sacrifice. Yeah, I mean, does that fundamentally just come down to jealousy? Do you think? Which I guess in many ways is is the reverse of happiness. I mean, I think there's an element, uh, Ayn Rand put it as envy, which I think is a, is a more accurate, uh, getting the emotional state. Yeah, how, how would you make so that distinction? So jealousy is, um, I'm jealous that you've got a beautiful house. I want something like that. And, and, and it can even motivate you to say, okay, then I'm, how did he get it? And what, what's required? And am I willing to pay that price? Envy is more, um, you've got a beautiful house. I wish you didn't. <laughs> right, I'm going to burn it down or yeah. something. Right, yeah. right, right. And it's not. Well, I you want don't to, deserve it, basically. Yeah, though I think that's often a rationalization. Mm -hmm. So it's it's you've got a beautiful house, or Bill Gates has built the most profitable company. I don't want him to have that. Oh, he was lucky. But, but he, no one actually believes that. And if you look at the life story, it's not, and this would have happened to anyone. And so, but if you paint it more like, well, there was no virtue here. There was nothing good here. There was no choices that he made that you should respect and try to emulate in your own life. It's just his, his environment and his, it's all determined. Then it's easy to think, why does he deserve this house? Mm -hmm. What did he do? He got lucky. And, but that is a means to make good on the envy or to camouflage it. Camouflage it, I think, both to the person himself that, no, I'm not saying I want to tear down things. I'm just saying he doesn't deserve it. So, and, and in the culture, it camouflages what the real motivation is. Um, but I think there is an, a real element of envy, of a, of a response to values of wanting to tear them down rather than trying to reach the same plateau or same level of achievement that someone else right reached. so let's let's stick with the tech portion of this because I think this brings this all sort of into a 2019 perspective you know you talk about Bill Gates I was thinking about well Mark Zuckerberg here's a guy who basically has created something incredible whether you like Facebook now at this point or put aside spying and the rest mm -hmm. of it but he created something that virtually everyone has mm -hmm. um, that's making tons of money the guy's probably you know I'm sure he's worth billions and billions of dollars can do whatever he wants for the rest of his life but it was only a couple months ago he was hauled in front of Congress. And I was I remember watching the, the hearing or watching some of the clips and it's like, he looked freaking miserable. And that's an interesting perspective that you could build and build and build and do create the thing that you want to create. But for all sorts of reasons that he may have known about or not known about, here he is now hauled in front of Congress, miserable. That's got to be a, an interesting spin on this whole thing. Yeah, and what's the perspective Congress takes on him, right? So uh, Facebook made some mistakes maybe somewhere. There are certainly things that hopefully we'll learn to do better going forward. But the, 
they've created something nobody knew how to create. It's a tremendous value to God knows how many people, billions and billions of people. That's why we're all on it. Um, and uh, no one knows how to do it better, despite the fact that they claim they do. If only, we, you know, he did it like this, but no one's I'm done working it. on it, I'm working right? on it. If you can do it better, I mean, I've been having this argument about you guys on, online, like, great that they're trying to make a better platform, yeah. rather than just bitching about the platforms they're on. Yeah, I'm not asking right. the government or someone else to do it, we're gonna or, try. Or you know? Facebook, right, so yeah. that's the issue. People aren't saying, you know, while you did something good, um, uh, we appreciate it, you know, now, and we're happy to use your platform, or not, because we're gonna come up with something better. It's scolding of him and chiding of him uh, and uh, being suspect of him uh, in ways that are inappropriate that drop the moral context of there was a real value created mm -hmm. here. Right. And have this kind of crybaby, whiny, you know, we're owed a platform like manna from heaven that does everything <laughs> we wish it would do without any damn effort on our part. We don't, if we want something better, we don't have to make it. And we don't have to acknowledge what you did to make the thing that we're using now. And that's the perspective people took on Zuckerberg. And the other part of it is there do seem to be some maybe dishonest things that were done by some of these companies. Certainly in the case of Uber, there were. But oh, I have no doubt about Think about, about that. the perspective. Yeah. If you're Travis Kalachnik, who's running Uber, and you're, uh, uh, who was running it, right, and you're the kind of person who has the headstrongness that you need to really be driven and produce values going up against this culture that says that there's nothing moral or good about that. Mm -hmm. uh, what's goodness is this other thing made off of like, you know, Mother Teresa and washing people's sores and, and uh, so forth like that. That's what goodness is and what you making Uber doing uh, is not good. Then, you know, you have to admire the independence of him to go and do that anyway because he recognized that it was good. But the whole society is failing these people by not appreciating the morality that's involved in what they're doing. And we don't have moral lessons that help them learn to do it better. So if they're taught their whole lives that what they want to do isn't good, um, it's not a shock that when things that are legitimate ethical issues, like whether to be honest about something, come up in their business, that they're not thinking of themselves as moral people and they're not holding themselves to those standards. Yeah. And, and there's another element that I found particularly outrageous and it, it flows, I mean, it, it's at present in different ways with both Facebook and Uber. The Facebook hearings, what the hearings should have been about is government failure. So one of the major things is the Russian ha hacking and what impact did they have on the elections. It's the government's responsibility to make sure our elections work properly and are fair. And, so, and if there's any kind of failure, it should have been a hearing about why was the government failing this? And, and so you're saying you're shocked that the government didn't hold themselves in front of themselves <laughs> to chide themselves. I'm not shocked by that, <laughs> but the public's reaction to it should be, no, what we should be investigating is government failures, not Facebook and all the values it's created that we all make use of and now we're gonna drag this this person as though he's committed a crime. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really had, it reminded me of these kind of show trials in communist country. It really had, and that he would be, like he didn't project that he's happy in that. No, that, <laughs> that was right, That well that was my point. It's yeah. like the guy's done so much in his life, I assume basically, basically lives a happy life, and where his life led him, and maybe it's because our system is out of whack and we don't, we don't value things properly and our government's too big and all of those things, but at the end of the day, he was the one that was sitting up there looking pretty miserable after pursuing yeah. something in his life that, that I think prescribed to most yeah. of the things you guys are talking about. It was about. a crime, but it was a moral crime, and it wasn't his, I think. And it's the same with Uber. It's, we want to have it both ways. So if you think of what was required to create Uber, you needed someone who would break the law. I mean, it's basically, he had to go into cities knowing that there's a taxi has a monopoly and so on, and hoping that there's enough user base so by the time that the, they get around to trying to squash this, there's gonna be too much public uproar. You needed someone, because you've set up really bad laws, mm -hmm. and you need someone to come in and break the law. And then you're gonna be surprised that, well, he cuts corners in other kinds of areas. You didn't open this right. market up to a Bill Gates, who I think wouldn't have done that. Um, and if it, so we, we, we th that we're going to criticize him rather than say, like, why did we have these laws? Why did we, we all use Uber or Lyft now? Why did we require 
that it had to be someone willing to break the law to create a company like this. Why did we put that kind of obstacle in mm -hmm. front of him? That should be the first question, not a big surprise that he cuts corners in some other right. areas. Because man, we could we could really person. do a whole other we could do a whole other series on that on why we've set up yeah. these systems so that all the innovators have to be these. Yeah. Uh, these types of people. But in essence, it's the idea that being driven by your own happiness, rather than being driven like Mother Teresa was, is bad. And so it's suspect when people do it. Mm -hmm. And um, and that that's what the ultimate I mean, role of these kind of punitive tax policies is and of uh, the regulatory state. I wanted to say one thing, though, also about Zuckerberg looking unhappy, like his choices brought him mm -hmm. to this state and uh, to this situation, and he seems unhappy in it, when at least in those moments before Congress. Right. Uh, and Anankar was talking about Bill Gates, and I think there is something tragic about Bill Gates' story. And part of what I really value in Rand's work is that it's this kind of great act of justice to these kinds of people, to these kinds of creators. And it says, particularly at Le Shrug, but a lot of her, particularly that novel, says what you're doing is good. You're doing the stuff that keeps human beings alive. And it's not just practical, it's moral. The way you're living, something that's essential to your way of life, is what's good about human beings. And having that perspective, um, I think, enables people to stand up better against the injustices to them. And even where they're forced to suffer the injustices, to understand and know what's happening to them and not have it impact their view of themselves and their self-esteem. And um, I think we can all, at our own scale of achievement, you know, learn that fact and it can help us be happier. All right, so let's shift a little bit. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we did an event with ARI where uh, you and Jordan Peterson got into it, really got into the nitty gritty, talking about morality and fact and can we derive morality uh, out, or can we derive value out of fact? And, and this whole conversation that he's been having with Sam Harris for a long time, obviously I've done a, a bunch of these with, with Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson and a whole bunch of other people. Uh, so let's dive into that a little bit. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I think you can derive morality from fact. Morality is in effect a perspective on facts that you have as a living organism with free will. So we're human beings. Human beings uh, can make choices. We don't automatically pursue any course of value. But there are nonetheless facts about us that make certain things will lead to our life and certain things will lead to our dying. Certain things that we try to pursue as goals will fit together in such a way that they'll add up to a life that sustains itself. And other ones won't add up so that achieving one value will frustrate or hamper the other, and you'll always be undermining yourself. And some means that you might choose to go after your values will be such that they'll be consistent with the type of values you need to seek to have a self-sustaining life, and other ones will maybe help you get the thing you're looking at in the short run, but will undermine the whole thing in the long run. And those set of facts uh, are the facts that you need to kind of use to guide you in choosing and setting your values. And I think that's what morality is about. So it's not, um, but they're, they're pretty abstract facts. So it's not, um, you know, this is how you should start your day. Uh, there might be good advice on how to start your day, but that's not morality. That's, you know, some more narrow field of advice, health advice or productivity advice. But broad facts about like, what are we doing here in this world? And mm -hmm. what does it take to achieve values and to survive as a human being here in this world? And so it's things like valuing your reason uh, being rational, which includes being honest, being independent, knowing only you can do your own thinking and it's up to you to do the work you need to make your life what you want it to be, uh, having integrity, being just in your interactions with other people, because whether they're good or bad affects you, and, uh, and so forth. And I think these are based on facts, but they're not simple, easily perceived in a moment facts, like what will lead to the most pleasure on mm -hmm. this time horizon, but facts about the nature of the universe that what's fake is fake, so pretending it's real is not gonna work for you, mm -hmm. facts like that. So that, that end part there gets into a little bit of what the nature of the discussion between Sam and Jordan is, that I don't think, I always find this tough to do this because I don't wanna play lawyer for, right. for right. either Sam or Jordan, and I also don't wanna pretend that I can lay out their arguments exactly as they would lay them out. So mm -hmm. that being said, to start this, the, the, your end point there, I think, is it seems to be the difference of where they're at, which is that Jordan, I don't think, would argue 
with anything that you just said, but then would say, you need another layer of this, which he would argue is stories. He would specifically argue are the stories of the Bible. Now, I know you're both of your feelings on the stories of the Bible, but talk to me a little bit about why the, assuming you agree with the, the original premise that Greg laid out, why stories are an integral part of the fabric that we're talking about here. I think one way to think about it, because I do think they are integral part to it, and it's important that that be understood, that they are crucial to moral development. Um, if you think... Can, of, can you explain why? Yeah, so yeah. that's what... If you yeah. think of yourself as developing morally, and then if you look of people who you, who you have some history with, so you saw a progression, um, this issue of emulation, I think, is really important that you have people that, and it can, and it's often fictional, and there's a reason I think it's often fictional, that you look up to and you admire and you say, I want to be like that. And you don't mean, I literally want to live that life, Jean Valjean, Les Miserables, and I want to be in prison for a while. Right. That's not, but there's something about him that you really admire because what uh, stories do and what fiction does and what literature does is they strip away a lot of the unessential detail and give you a vision of what's essential. So you have an idea of there's a way that Jean Valjean faces life and takes himself now, I mean, there's a, it's a redemption story, takes himself seriously and wants to build something for him. And I want to be like that. And when you think of younger kids, when they sports fit. I want to be like Mike. I mean, that was Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. It's not if they, if all of them think I'm going to be the greatest NBA player ever. But Jordan had a incredible dedication to his craft, mm -hmm. incredible courage. You see him, he's got the flu and he's still playing. So, and I can be like that. I could have that in me. And so moral development is thinking of the kinds of traits of character that I could embody and I could be, and that would be my life, and it's a life that I want to live. And stories are, um, I think, indispensable to help someone to start abstract. We were talking about the comic books yeah. um, that you have uh, uh, up. Um, and I read comic books as a kid, and it you read them from that perspective, whether it's a Spider-Man or a Captain America. When you think, I want to be like that, it's not, I want to be bitten by a radioactive spider, and, <laughs> though it might be cool. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but it's, yeah. there's, uh, there's uh, uh, I think there's a Spider-Man character, an honesty to him, um, that he really faces his problems and doesn't try to shy away from any, he has a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah. And, and you can think, that's what I want to be. And I think moral development is, it starts at that relatively primitive level and you get more sophisticated. So I think like in Les Miserables and jean Valjean, he's a more complex character than Spider-Man is. Right. But it's the same process that you're thinking, yeah, there's something really admirable about him. You can learn a lot about somebody here because you're going to Les Mis. I would have given you Star Wars, the story of Luke. What, what, what would you have given me here? Um, for early stories, uh, Robin Hood was a big one for me when I was a kid. Um, also, um, but, what, but I assume somebody would say, but that must be against your economic belief. He was stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. Yeah, he's even uh, he's even referenced <laughs> negatively in Atlas Shrugged. Yeah, yeah. But then John Valjean's not a, right. um, an obvious egoist hero either. But he's someone who uh, he had personal val he had some political values he took really seriously, right? And he had personal values. He fights for Maid Marian, right? So. Uh, and what's just matters to him, and uh, he's opposing tyranny. Um, so it's these abstract, and there's a kind of valuing of excellence in the Robin Hood story, mm -hmm. and particularly if you think about the encounters between him and the early Merry Men, so there's, you know, this kind of conflict with Little John, and they mm -hmm. each respect that the other was, you know, willing to go to the mat for, their, for, for himself and not back down, and a friendship is forged from that, and so, you know, there was a lot to admire in, in those stories. Uh, even if, uh, and anyway, it was the you know king who was taxing them that he was dealing with. Anyway. <laughs> right, right. That's a, that's a different thing. So, if somebody was to take, so again, I don't want to quote Jordan specifically, but for for a set of people that would say, well, the stories of the Bible, maybe not in a literal sense, but the stories of the Bible are the right set of stories to live a moral life. So I believe them, you know. So I can take that that leap of faith to get there. Do you think that's a sort of skirt of your 
responsibility as a person if that's what you then say belief is? Um, well, it depends what you mean by when I, I'm going to take them. So if you start to think, well, these are literally true and things like that, then I think it is. So I don't mean it in yeah. a literal sense. I, I mean it in the way that I think most people discussing this, or at least when I'm having conversations these days, I don't think most people are talking about it in a literal sense. I'm t I think they're talking about it in a metaphorical sense that the, the, the lessons of these stories are, are transcendent the way yeah. I think, Les Mis or Spider-Man. I are. think they are, but I think often the moral lesson is wrong or really, I mean, really wrong. Yeah. Can, really can you give wrong. me an example yeah, of one of those? So yeah. if, if um, you take the story of Abraham and Isaac in the, uh, um, in the Bible, I know there's a lot of different interpretations of it, but I think it's meant as this is what it means to have faith. You will this do is, something so bananas. <laughs> yes. And, and your whole, thinking about happiness, your whole being is protesting. Why do I have to murder? So this story, uh, he, he's told by, that he has to murder his own son. And like, why do I have to do this? This is going to destroy, I mean, it's going to kill him. It's going to destroy my life. This is one of my most important values. And I have to give it up for no reason. And I think the part, point of the story is, He's good because he doesn't question. He must be feeling that, mm -hmm. but he doesn't question it. He doesn't ask, Look, can you explain to me again why I have to do this? It's, no, I've been ordered, in effect, to do this. And that is, that, that is a moral, I mean, it's, it's about how to act, but I think that's not at yeah. all how to act. So yeah, I, for the record, I've heard the counter arguments on this from people that have been in the studio just in the last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. from Rabbi Wolpe and Bishop Barron, that it's that you will do something so outside of yourself that at the last moment it will come to be not the, the horrible thing that perhaps it was. That, that would yeah. be a, a, so a, very, give, a very simple yeah, summation of that argument. You can give kind of metaphorical readings of it, but then I think what you're doing is you're bringing in your own moral views and saying, well, this must be what the story means because then it would be a good story, not a bad lesson. Mm -hmm. And then, it, it's, it, then it's not the source of morality. And I don't think stories are the source. They help you think about morality right. and isolate moral traits. So, so I think that what the way I read the Isaac and Abraham story is isolating a moral issue. I think it's on the wrong side of it, but it helps you think about that. And I think the lesson one should take is never act on faith yeah. <laughs> like this. That's what you should think. This is monstrous to do this. Yeah. But it's helping you isolate the issue. So I think stories help you do that. They don't help you figure out. I mean, they help you, but they're not decisive in saying what's right and what's wrong. You really have to think about that. And if the, the way you, the, you were painting the scenario is, well, it's a story in the Bible, so the lesson must be right. So, I don't think that right. is true. Yeah. But I think it's... Right, that's not what yeah, I was saying. I was right. just saying this, a certain set of people might view it that way. And mm -hmm. Greg could talk more about this, but I think it's significant when you're thinking about just morality and stories. The role that Homer plays in ancient Greece is... Because so, it doesn't have to be a Bible. And, mm -hmm. it, it, and I, it's, like, it's important that in Greece it wasn't. Um, it's, it's poetry and sagas or... And, and the, the attitude that the Greeks had towards that, I think it's that they, that they respected Homer is in part because you could isolate all these kinds of moral issues. But there are different issues. Yeah. Um, and I think closer to the truth, actually. You know, interestingly, one of the reasons when I first learned about Greek mythology in, I don't know, seventh grade or something, one of the reasons I really liked it was I liked the lessons, but it was also so over the top that there's a god in the water that's sort of like Aquaman in Poseidon, <laughs> and Zeus is throwing bolts of lightning down, uh -huh. that it was so over the top that it obviously, I, in my mind as a seventh grader, it was so like, oh, these aren't factually true because these are crazy stories with the Kraken coming out and Medusa and uh -huh. chopping off heads. That it was like, oh, we're going to teach you a lesson here, but we're going to do it in a very over-the-top way. I think, it, it, for me, it at least allowed me to think of these things a little cleaner than, say, mm -hmm. the, the Old Testament, which is you know, it's very fact-based in a certain way in that there isn't uh, a Poseidon and there aren't... you know unearthly creatures. And it puts you, when, when you're clear that it's not true, or that you don't believe it, right, it puts you in more of a position to think about what lessons are there here, and which of them are good, and which of them that aren't. And if you think about, uh, you mentioned Homer, and the Greek philosophers are in this dialogue with Homer, where they're really criticizing some things in him. Like, this isn't true, he makes the gods do awful stuff. A god wouldn't do something like that. If a god was all good, he wouldn't be just, you know, knocking up women left and right and so forth, which 
gods tend to do. Um, but, uh, but there is some core of truth, and here's what it is. Or um, um, Achilles being, you know, flying into murderous rages all the time and, and is not good. That wasn't a good trait of his. But taking certain issues really seriously and more seriously than money or life and death maybe is good. So you see that in, in the way Plato and Aristotle and some of the even earlier and, and later Greeks are thinking about Homer. I would say that there's another aspect I want to highlight to this role of story. Um, I said earlier that I think that the truths that you know correct morality is about are these fairly abstract truths. There are things like um, what's your relationship to reality? What should it be? Um, should you be trying to achieve things for yourself by your own judgment, or should you be subordinate to other people's judgment or something else's judgment? It's this kind of level of, of truth that I think um, morality is about. Or falsehoods, if it's a false mm -hmm. morality. Uh, one that says that you should be subordinate to God or to the Fuhrer or to society at large and do whatever they say and not rock the boat. And those kinds of claims, whether they're true claims or false claims, are very abstract. And they're, they're not like what you experience in a moment. So it's, it's hard to get your head around them and what they would mean and what it would mean to lead a life like that. And a large part of the role of art, and of stories in particular, is to give you in concrete, that so you can like look at or picture, mm -hmm. you know, what it would be like to live by this code versus that code. And that process of seeing it in the stories, um, and also seeing the cause-effect relations, which are put in much sharper relief in stories than they are in real life. And thinking about, are these really the cause-effect relationships? Is this really hap what happens when you blindly obey an authority that at the last minute says, no, I'm just kidding, don't kill your son? Uh, or is what happens that you murder six million people? Which of those things is what happens when you really blindly obey an authority? Um, and uh, the stories put you in a position to think about that. Uh, they make it easier to hold in mind and easier to connect to your motivation. But I still think what you're doing is evaluating certain claims about the world. Is independence important or is faith and obedience important? And in my view, the, the, the consistent message of certainly the Old Testament is that faith and obedience are the most important thing. So then what would you say about the person that is that could live the exact life based on the principles that you guys are laying out here, except with one caveat, which is that they just consider themselves a believer. They, they just believe in something that is not provable, that is not purely based on logic and reason in their mind, but they've still attained an ability to live a life based on all of the things that we've talked about for the last hour. Because I think there's a certain amount of people that are doing something along those lines. Well, I think it, it depends on how seriously they're taking they are a believer. Um, and the more seriously they take that, I think the more they experience, I've got different parts of me that I can't put together mm -hmm. into a whole. And I think part of the um, perspective on happiness of, of, of is, it's, it's experience of a successful life is you're experiencing it as it's an integrated whole, that there's not clashes where if I'm doing this, then I'm sacrificing that. So it all fits together. And I, and I think Bill Gates is an example of this, of non-religious, um, but still there's a way in which it's a believer, that he swallowed the whole egalitarianism perspective, that I didn't build this. And if you're, if he really believes it, it has, and again, if you're thinking of the time span of a life, it has an impact mm -hmm. because he, and the more he's a thinker and so he's trying to put these elements together that don't fit together. And at some point I think it's, well, I just have to take this other path because that's more in line with my belief. So, so I think there are some nominally religious people who I think of as on the whole, leading a rational, productive life, um, and they're building a life for themselves, and the religious element's sort of a remnant. Yeah. But the more seriously it's taken, I think the more there has to be clashes that yeah. you're thinking. See, it's interesting, because I find, I think most people probably fall into that. We know that just statistically, most people are believers. Mm -hmm. But I don't think most people are believers in the traditional sense of belief. I think they're sort of nominal believers, and then hopefully they can take logic and reason and build a decent life. But I think a lot of people just don't think of all these things seriously 
at all. They just sort of, you live your life and there's sort of these incongruent pieces that yeah. you walk around with and sometimes they all kind of lock up and, and, and sometimes And to go they back don't. to the issue of the pursuit of happiness, that's part of what, I think why it's in the Declaration of Independence. This is a lifelong activity. It's difficult to do, but if you really want a life that you look back on and say, I'm glad I lived that, you have to do it. Um, but it's not easy. So it's to, to think, to, there's, along with the idea that happiness is just about laughing at dinner or whatever, there's a perspective on it in which it's easy, like just do whatever you feel like doing. So that's so not what is required yeah. to reach happiness. There's a video, it's online somewhere. I was, it's from seven or eight years ago. I was talking to my grandma who's now since gone. And I asked and she had uh, sort of middle stage dementia. And that's why we did the video. I wanted to remember some. I wanted to remember some things with her. And I asked her how she's doing, and she said, without any hesitation, she said, "Happy to be alive." And I thought, wow, she must have done something right along mm -hmm. the way that she didn't pause or hesitate. That that was just what she said. All right, so let's let's shift because uh, there's a couple more things I want to do with you guys. Let's talk about free will. Okay. How does that fit into the equation here? Well, Ankar has been talking about it a fair amount over the course of of today. Uh, if you think about the you didn't build that kind of ideology, mm -hmm. right? There's the idea that what you have is a result of luck. And um, it's luck in part about your circumstances and also luck about your genetic, uh, you know, what you were born with and so forth. And if you really take that seriously, um, that you're not making choices, then you're not really in charge of what happens to your life. You have nothing to be proud about you have nothing to blame yourself or other people about, which some people might find nice, but you also have nothing to be proud about. You, your life can't really be an achievement. And, and it's just, if you think of yourself as in the driver's seat of your life and other people as in the driver's seat of theirs, as making choices, it leads to a very different perspective on morality, on life, on judgment, then if you think I'm a bit of flotsam tossed around by factors outside of my control, and maybe the shape of the bit of flotsam I have yeah. has something to do with how I get tossed around. And I think that if you really think about our normal moral reasoning and the kind of thinking that's going involved when you're make, that's involved when you're making a decision, and that has to be involved when you're making a decision, when you're trying to figure out whether something's true, uh, it's a presupposition of all of that, that you are actually in control in those moments, that you are free, that you are able to make choices. And then there are certain views coming from, and this has been the case since ancient Greece, coming from what was then cutting edge science mm -hmm. and coming from the religion of the time, both, that have led people to think, no, that can't be right. We can't really have that kind of control. And so then there's a lot of thinking that goes place. And this is a whole debate over free will throughout the history of, well, is it the case that we don't have it and this view that we normally have of ourselves is an illusion? That's the kind of position that Harris is now representing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, is it the case that we have it and there's something wrong with the scientific or religious beliefs that incline us to think we don't? Maybe the beliefs are false or we're interpreting them wrongly? Uh, or is there some way that this tension between the two things is, is a confusion? And those are really the three positions right. in, in philosophy. Uh, and my own view is that there really isn't uh, evidence against free will. Uh, and we can tell we have it when we're making choices. So uh, I think it's rational to believe in it. It's not reasonable not to. I mean, I think a lot of smart people don't, but I think if you actually follow through the arguments, there aren't good arguments against it. And uh, So I think, and again, this is where I don't like playing lawyer for, for my former guest, but I think the first time that I had Sam on and we talked about this, he mm -hmm. said, let's do a quick test to, to check this. Yeah. And he said, name a celebrity. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do it to you and then I'll, so name a celebrity. Sam Harris? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a deeply profound <laughs> thing right there. But his argument would be that in your mind, you only had a li you didn't have every set of celebrities available there. You only had a limited set. Yeah. So that is not pure free will. I I'm, I I'm doing this in the most sort of loose, vague yeah, sort I of think, way. Uh, so if you think that to have free will, you have to be a kind of nothing that could choose. I could name some Bollywood star I've never heard of or something, and that would be the proof that I have free will, that I could do something at random, in effect. Uh, then yeah, we don't have that, and it's crazy to think we have that. But I think that position is a sort of straw man of what free will would really look like, and it's one that's been, I mean, all of Harris's arguments on this, or almost all of them, the, the style of argument he's using, is what you find in David Hume, who's brilliant, and so that's not any knock on Harris, but um, it's the same kind of arguments you find in Hume, and it comes from a, 
a view of what freedom would be like that is, um, I don't think, right. And then, so if I was listening just, in fact, we were talking about this uh, uh, last night over dinner. I mm-hmm. flew in yesterday and I was listening to podcasts on the plane and one of them was Harris talking to uh, someone, or I forget who, about free will uh, on his show and, and talking about the self more generally on his show. And what they say the self is like and then say it's an illusion is not at all like what I experience myself as like. There's this idea in Hume, and you find it in Harris, that the self, which is supposed to be free, is like a passenger that's sitting in your head, Mm -hmm. and it's having your experiences, and then somehow it magically changes the course of of the future. Um, I don't experience myself as a passenger in my head, as something other than the me that's embodied, that's having my experiences. I experience it as my reason, as the fact that my reason can assert itself, as the fact that sometimes when there's a question, there's a you know, good enough answer that's easy and there's something you have to reach for and that I can do that reaching or not do that reaching. And um, that's where I think the free will is, not in that I can move my hand at random or produce something that's somehow out of the causal order of the universe. And I think that that fact about me and about all of us, that we can kind of turn on our minds, engage, probe deeper, or on the other hand, push away something that's uncomfortable, I don't want to think about it, and I don't, rather that, or I, you know, I can lean into or lean away from the pain of the discomfort of thinking about it. That alternative that I have, that's what I think is free will. And uh, I think it's just a causal fact about us that we have the, just like, you know, glasses can roll, but they can only roll one way, we can either turn on or turn off our minds in these moments, and we cause whichever one we do, and it's up to us. I don't know that you can top that on free will, but I will give you the opportunity. Let's tie it back to morality and happiness, because I think it's not, one can think of this sort of, it's an academic dispute, are we free? I think it's really important in life to think about the way in which you're free, so the way in which you're making choices that determine the direction you're taking, and the things that are not under your direct chosen control. Well, we were talking about moral development in terms of stories, and I've been talking about it in terms of emulating people. But part of that separation is, I gave Newton as one of Jefferson's heroes, of separating out, okay, it's not under my control. It's not an issue of direct choice. Am I gonna be a genius or not? But am I gonna face the facts and go where they lead and if they lead to conclusions that no one's held before and the church doesn't like, so I'm still going there. That I think is under direct, per- and that's part of what you're separating out in terms of getting what are the moral characteristics, what are the ones that I can choose and have direct control over versus all kinds of things that aren't. And mm-hmm. it's, I'm never gonna be Michael Jordan, I'm never gonna be an Isaac Newton, but I can nevertheless emulate the aspects of them that are directly, they're directly choosing and I'm directly choosing. And so that, in terms of thinking about morality and and of thinking, what do I really have control over and what maybe only extended and maybe something, I'm not gonna be a genius like Newton, no matter what I do. Um, So I have no control over that. Um, uh, That I can become much more productive than I am, yeah, maybe 10 years from now it's not directly chosen, but there's all kinds of things I can do to try to get to there. That, in terms of thinking about morality, it's really important to think about this and have a view of, yeah, okay, this is what's under my control and this is what isn't. And the kind of egalitarian perspective is nothing's under your control. Mm-hmm. And that's the, then you don't have free will. And it's you, you, nothing you choose makes any difference. It's all determined for you. And you have a very different perspective on your life if you think that. Yeah, well, that, that's actually a good segue. So I've, I've got two more for you. So what would you say to the, the person watching this who's going, all right, this is all, I can, I can take in so much of this in my, in my day-to-day life. This is all well and good. But at the end of the day, we're just a little speck on a planet that's a little pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan would say, in the middle mm-hmm. of the Milky Way that's in a galaxy, in a universe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Unfashionable end of the Western spiral arm. Bingo. Like what, you know, so, you know, who, why does it matter? Why does it even matter at the end of the day? Why shouldn't I just pilfer any ple- uh, pleasure I can get and fulfill my hedonistic desires and, and all of those things? I think that's... A, a kind of religious point of view in an odd way. But what does it mean to matter? What it means to matter is to matter to someone. 
and so to matter to you, to matter to the people that you love, to the people that are around you. Uh, what's going on in that question is you're expecting it to matter to the universe. And oh, I'm really small in the grand scheme of things, so I don't matter to the universe. Uh, so, you know, I'm kind of um, sad about it and I'm going to act out, so to speak, and steal or whatever, pilf pilfer, uh, bits of hat pleasure. Um, but that's, you know, being raised on a god, being raised on a universe that's made by someone to whom you matter. And then being sad that he's not there, if you come to think he's not there. And one of the, I think, the worst effects of religion on people is, being raised religious on people, is not so much a falsehood that it places in them, but that it stifles the ability to develop um, really having things matter to you and really thinking about what you want out of life. And if you've done that, and to whatever extent you've done it, you could double down on doing it, you see that that's all that there is to mattering. And it's not all that there is in like some little way. That's what it means for something to matter. There's a consciousness that um, values something, that values a bunch of things that fit together into a whole that you can feel proud of, excited about, love that you're doing it. That's what mattering is. And uh, if there was a God, nothing would matter and nothing could matter to him. I mean, nothing could affect him. He has no reason to do anything. People say, God has a plan, he did this because of that. Well, if you're omniscient and you can, omnipotent and you can just make anything happen, you never have a reason to do anything. There's no planning involved. There's no, there's no meaning in a life with God, uh, in a life where something matters to the universe. What mattering is, is mattering to someone. And your life can matter to you if you think about what you want out of it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, this is one of the things that I learned from Rand that made a really deep impression early on. It's that this whole idea of looking for something outside yourself, that that's gonna tell you you're doing a good job or you matter to them. I mean, it's typically the religious, but it can get extended to there's some, I have to look outside myself. And what she's really advocating is no, you have to build a life that you love and then it matters to you. Um, and. The, the, the two books, the two of Ayn Rand's fiction, we've been talking about stories and so on, yeah. of, that everybody knows is um, The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, but her first novel is called We the Living. Mm -hmm. And I really like the heroine, the, so the lead character, who's Kira, or her first name's Kira, in it. And she has this perspective on her life. And the book, it has a, I mean, a really powerful ending, I think, and it's on this question exactly of what and she does not have the perspective of, I'm this little speck in the cosmos. Um, she has a completely reverse perspective of, mm -hmm. it, it, there was my life, and I've lived it, and I've lived it without compromise, so, and that's what matters. Uh, but it's, it's, I mean, it's fiction, and it's yeah. much more powerful than, yeah, yeah. than what well, I'm but, I, but, but in but a nonfiction sense, I hear Jordan Peterson talking about mm -hmm. this all the time. It is your, you know, he, despite the religious difference yeah. that you have, and perhaps the, the importance of the religious story specifically, that, what you just said there, is completely aligned. Mm -hmm. That it is your life, you must do what is best for you, so that maybe you're doing better for other people and everything else, but it's your, it's yours. Get mm -hmm. some meaning out of it. Yeah. And, and that's, that's pretty powerful. Yeah. Peterson and Harris, I think, are both really interesting and in a way really positive cultural phenomena, uh, even though there are a lot of things on which I disagree with each of them, because they're people who are pushing people to take ideas really seriously, to think more deeply than they are, uh, including about what they want out of life, especially in, in Peterson's case, but also Harris too, to some extent. Uh, and I think this is, if I think back 10 years ago or 20 years ago, who was on the cultural scene, there weren't people who were doing that. Um, and, you know, I think it's a really good development that they're doing this kind of work. So I think my, my last question then would be, in an age where we're just slammed with information and we're slammed with fake news and we're slammed with, you have the world at your pocket all the time, you can be endlessly distracted, and yet so many great things happen out of that. You mentioned Uber before and just all the technological advancements. How can you just stay sort of centered enough to, to focus on a life that will give you happiness? I mean, I would use social media as sort of the easy example of this. It's like, we all have social media. We, actually, I, 
If I'm not mistaken, you're not on Twitter. <laughs> well, now we just yeah, got. Yeah. I've been yeah. trying to get him out. No, no, no. It's the key to happiness. Yeah. Okay. So that, that was the right ending. So we know why Ankar is happy. You're on Twitter. I don't know why you're happy. But but I think that that's without being glib about it. I actually think there's something interesting there, which is that there's so much misery all day long. You can go online, and then people who seemingly are good, functioning, happy, healthy people offline and behave mm-hmm. well and are pleasant to each other. Mm-hmm. Online, everyone hate each other, and we spend time in a, in a digital world that does not bring, that often does not bring happiness. Mm-hmm. There's, my, I mean, I, there's wonderful things that have happened out of it too. We're, we're doing this Here because we of that. Right. So, you know, I, but putting that aside, there's an awful lot of people that spend a lot of time doing things, and it doesn't have to just be Twitter. It could be the diminishing returns of watching porn or playing video games or whatever it is that ultimately don't make you happy. Uh-huh. So how in a world that we're so in- intertwined with technology can we, can we manage this happiness level? So there's a lot of sort of detail questions like what are some good hacks? What are some good ways to organize your day? And I don't have any great special wisdom on that. I know some people, there are different systems and you take a a month off every year and you know, that might really work well. It's actually, yeah, it really has helped. But at the level of a, what I could say as a philosopher about this, right? The thing that I think is common to all the things that would work and we should all try to find more things that have this in common is you have to think about why do I want this thing in my life? If it's Twitter or Facebook or YouTube, and what role do I want it to play? And am I using it and interacting with it in a way that's consistent with that? And likewise with all the people involved. So I I get involved, actually not much on Twitter, but I'm on Facebook a lot and I'm involved in some acrimonious discussions on it. But I think about when I'm doing it, uh, why am I doing this? Why am I posting this? Why do I want to get in this conversation? What are my goals here? Uh, why am I interacting with this guy who I think is being a bit of a dick and am I being a dick back to him or not? How should I deal with it, right? And sometimes I think, yeah, I don't have a good reason. I should cut this out. Yeah, that's uh, other, usually the answer. But, but. <laughs> but other times I think I do. There's, some, there's a certain point I'm trying to make. I, I want a role model that there's a way to do this that's uh, intellectually active and honest. I think there are people that I'm reaching who I'm um, uh, maybe teaching to be more honest about it. And more importantly, there are things I'm learning from it, either about what the other side thinks or what, um, uh, um, or about what information I might have a blind spot to, because we're all kind of, you know, in our filter bubble blind spot some of the time. So if someone thinks this is a good policy and I think it's crazy, you know, well, what, what do you know that I don't? Or what do you mm-hmm. think that I don't anyway? And I can yeah. see if it's true. So there are, I think, really good reasons to, to engage in this stuff. You have to think about what yours is and are you acting consistently with it. And often that might mean cutting out a lot of it or it might mean doing more of it in some cases, but doing it with a focus where you know why you're in it. And so you're therefore not upset when like, you know, everybody doesn't dow down before you and click heart when you say <laughs> some point and some of them push back. Yeah. Uh, I will, as a man that's not on Twitter, I feel like I should give you the final word here. Uh, great. Um, I think what philosophy teaches you is to ask why and to and why about everything and as deep as you can go. So for this kind of stuff, I think you have to ask, why am I doing this? What am I trying to achieve? What am I getting out of it? What is it doing to me? And so I've seen people who all the online comments, they take it now as this is representative of humanity. Yeah. Sort. And right, it, like, and it, that, like that's the whole of humanity yeah, right Yeah, and there. it's yeah. really coloring their whole view of the world, their experience and interactions with people. They're more suspicious of people. And you have to ask, okay, that's happening to me. Why am I still doing this? Is there a way that I can think about it as, as no, I have to keep reminding myself these are not representative of humanity as such. And if I'm not able to do that, maybe I do have to cut back. But it's to ask the deep questions about not I'm just doing this, but why am I doing this? And I think the birth of philosophy, if you think of Socrates as particularly when we're getting moral philosophy, that's what he, he went around Athens asking people, like, why are you doing this? Um, and often you don't have a good reason. And that should, yeah. that's an opportunity to think about it, not, oh, yeah, keep, keep going. But and that that's the value that I get out of philosophy. I have to say I'm very torn right now whether I'm supposed to tell you to get on Twitter so that you can promote videos like this and and experience some of this stuff, or if you're if you're doing it right, I'm actually not totally sure. Well, you've been trying to convince him. So I don't <laughs> well, know. We whether. were doing a class together online, and yeah. being on Facebook. <laughs> right, that helps. So he now has a Facebook account, but with no picture on it, nothing else, no friends. <laughs>
Reminder everyone, this is just one in a series of videos that I'm doing right here on the Ayn Rand Institute channel. And for more of the videos, you can click the link right down below.